All right, so we're going to kind of pick up where uh, Kloss left off this morning. As you can tell, it's, he's kind of free flow on thoughts. Uh, the title for this session yeah. is Managing Crop Pests and Diseases Through Practices, Not Products. We started to hear that today or, or this morning where he talked about we're inserting a different crop in the rotation. It can be as simple as that, although not, not super simple to observe and, and make these changes and see them happen, but uh, it can be as simple as that in terms of how we influence the, the, the system to manage pest issues. So I'm gonna let Klaus take this where he wants. Uh, no slides. Um, when he's finished, I'll just have a, a few brief announcements and then we'll, we'll move on to lunch. Um, Klaus? I, I love interruptions, so if you have specific pests, I. Uh, I might end up saying I don't know, but I'd be happy to um, adjust according to what you want to hear. But I, I'll give an interesting example, uh, something that uh, I learned in California. There's uh, romaine, organic romaine lettuce has a problem with an aphid that gets in the heart. And if you have that aphid in the heart of the lettuce, and it doesn't show in the, in the head until you open it up, it makes it slimy, which is really rough on the, your repeat business. There was an extension agent, or actually he was, uh, I think he was USDA, but he was also a, in an extension position in California, who noticed that if you have sweet alyssum, you know, the little flower planted near this uh, romaine lettuce, that you won't have that aphid. And he set up an experiment where they planted every fourth row, they transplanted the sweet alyssum. So they'd have a row of flowers and three rows of uh, romaine, row of flowers, or it might have been four, but it, it was a pattern. And they ended up having no problems with aphids at all. Well, then he said, well, that's a lot of land and it costs a lot for all these flowers, can I reduce it? It turned out that if he had 44 sweet alyssum flowers on each acre. He could eliminate the entire pest. And it had zero reduction in yield. I mean, that 44 plants on an acre did, uh, had no measurable impact on his lettuce yield. But I thought that was a really interesting application of this idea. Uh, I don't think he ever figured out exactly what the biological chain was, but apparently there was a control organism, probably a control species, that the sweet alyssum needed for its life cycle, needed to have the sweet alyssum for its life cycle, that having that, just having those few plants in the field just eliminated a very expensive problem. And I would think conventional farmers would find that's a whole lot cheaper than buying pesticides and having to get out there on a spray schedule for that one particular pest. And that's, that's a point I wanted to make, is certified organic is a tremendous marketing tool, but the practices that we learn can be applied anywhere. You don't have to be certified organic to use these, uh, these techniques and these practices. They work, and yes, quite often they work better. Uh, I'm gonna follow up on the yellow mustard because there was the Organic Farming Research Foundation uh, funded a small research project way back 20 years ago. And this was back when we were working with using the yellow mustard for the bean root rot. And of course, in the Salinas Valley of California, I think at that, that time, land was renting for $3,000 an acre. I think today you couldn't rent it for $10,000 an acre, it's strawberry land. And they were trying to figure out how to grow organic strawberries because they were not only valuable, but some produce brokers have gotten to the point where they'll tell you, I'll buy your conventional if you supply me X uh, cases or X loads of organic. You know, that having the organic was actually the foot in the door to sell the rest of the crop. That's, actually, that's true down in Georgia with the Vidalia growers, where uh, some of the Vidalia growers are growing organic even though it's a loss. Uh, and this was a few years ago. I'm sure they figured out how to do it at a profit because they needed it for market access with their brokers to get into the different stores. But what OFRF's small piece of research discovered 
was that by putting broccoli waste, and broccoli waste has the same glucosinolate that the yellow mustard does, they're brassicas, uh, mulching it on strawberry beds, they could give the same de infestation that they got with methyl bromide. And one of the reasons there's so much methyl bromide used was anyway before it was outlawed. Uh, today it's outlawed, but I guess you can use up your old product, and some of the farms bought a 10 year supply to make sure they were still using it. But or obviously, organic farmers couldn't use it. But they discovered that they could uh, take care of the pests by mulching that ground with broccoli waste. Uh, they've, done, they've continued to do more work, and from that small grant, they've gotten some big uh, USDA grants. They've developed a technique called anaerobic de-infestation. So instead of just turning in the mustard like we do, they were uh, putting that uh, brassica in the field, flooding it, and then covering it so that the field went anaerobic. And they're getting equal results to a methyl bromide uh, fumigation without any of the poison, without any of the negative effects. And they're able to, uh, to actually detoxify these beds that have been in strawberries way too long. Now, I'm, I'm not advocating that because I think having a more balanced rotation makes a lot more sense. But it does illustrate how powerful some of these biological tools are and how powerful some of the biological controls are. Uh, I'll give a, just throw out another example of a biological control. And this, this is learning from nature how things work. There is a, a pesticide product. I don't know if any of you buy uh, products from Marone Bio Innovations. Uh, Pam Marone is a friend. She was on the Dean's Council at Cornell. But uh, she had worked for Monsanto and started a company using uh, materials found in nature to control pests. And they've got uh, one product called uh, Regalia, which is actually an extract of Japanese knotweed. And if you treat a plant with that ahead of getting in effect attacked by powdery mildew or downy mildew, it will actually launch the plant's immune system so that it becomes immune to the mildew. The trick is you've got to be there before the infection with the treatment. But it's a very, it's a very safe uh, way to treat. And I, th I think we're just starting to learn from nature how, pow how powerful some of the natural controls that are out there between plants are. Uh, there are a couple of processes, and this all relates back to some of the things we can do. Uh, systemic acquired resistance and induced, uh, systemic induced resistance. Uh, this, is, this is a process where the plant's immune system can be stimulated either by a microbe that's living in the root system or by a, a protein or some kind of a stimulant that is applied to the plant. And it will kick the plant's immune system into high gear and make it so it's not susceptible. And this is somewhat the, the principle regalia works on, but there are a lot more of these materials. And we're finding that some soils already have the right microbes in them. And they're being fed by the exudates of the plant root. And one of the ways they're repaying the plant for what it's getting, uh, for the sugars and the food that it's getting, is by producing these compounds and, and launching an immune response in the crop that makes the crop su not susceptible. And I'm wondering how many times when we have a very healthy crop in a field where we've done everything right but we don't know what we did right, are we benefiting from the microbes that are living in the soil that are actually building this immunity uh, to the plant, for the plant? Uh, we were part of an experiment that never got published. And I don't know how many of you heard a couple years back that Monsanto was funding uh, research into the halo effect to start measuring the benefits that us organic farmers were getting from having GMO corn all around us. And they set it up to show that, that the GMO BT corn was killing the uh, corn borer 
in the rootworm and protecting the organic farms around it. Uh, they ran the experiment twice, and we, we were one of the sites. Uh, they never published it because what it was showing was that the pests were all leaving our farm and heading toward the BT corn. And they actually ran it a second time to verify the data, but then they decided not to publish afterwards. And this ties back to my observation uh, yesterday that I brought up about our velvet leaf. And for those who weren't here, uh, we had a real problem with velvet leaf on our farm when we started because when we were starting our transition. And then we discovered that it had a fungus attack, the velvet leaf, called an anthracnose. And then uh, the next thing we found, there was a virus attacking the velvet leaf. And then we found that the velvet leaf was covered with white flies. And I had believed first along that it was, the velvet leaf was sick because of the fungus and then, or because of the fungus and the virus. And then for sure, when I noticed the insects, but I had it backwards. The insects and those diseases were attacking the plants because the plants were, uh, because the velvet leaf was sick. This is how the biology in the soil can give protection. Uh, the most successful project that the Soil Health Institute launched last year was a conference uh, that I don't think we could have imagined 10 years ago. It was titled The Intersection of Soil Health and Human Health. It was sold out. It was very heavily attended by both doctors and soil scientists where they were actually showing direct c correlations between people's health and the soil that th what they were eating grew in. You know, this was called voodoo or hearsay 10 years ago, but now we're starting to see medical evidence uh, for that. I've gotten a, a contact from a Chinese company that does protein extractions and again, I'm, I'm way out there with what's the future bringing, but what can we expect from our university and our research? They've discovered that there is a, a protein in cannellini beans. It's actually a more, much more complicated protein, white kidneys, that is more effective in controlling blood sugar than any of the uh, pharmaceuticals with no side effect, which maybe uh, people on a Mediterranean diet that eat a lot of beans and greens may be healthy because they're being protected by what they're eating. But the rest of the story is if you're not growing these beans in healthy soil, they may not have anywhere near as much of the beneficial ingredient. So this, this is kind of the, the backdrop of this. And we had a grant come in when I was on the board reviewing grants at OFRF where a, a graduate student wanted to study the effects of endophytes on, and I, I don't remember the details of the crop. Now, are you familiar with what endophytes are? You probably, anyone that's had fescue, what's the endophyte and fescue do? <laughs> yep, and with horses, it causes hoof, uh, foot trouble. Uh, the cows don't gain well. The cows don't really like to eat it. Well, if we don't just have microbes in the root system that are doing the things I've described so far, we also have microbes inside the plant. Uh, we have microbes inside us. It's called our microbiome. And shortly after the microbiome was discovered, they discovered there's a phytobiome. And one year the UN designated it for research purposes as the year of the phytobiome, which was discovering all these microbes that are not the plant, but they live in the plant directly, not just in the soil, just like we have that same set in us. And a couple of years later, they discovered there is the terabiome. The terabiome is these plants, these uh, things that grow around the roots that our crops are supporting. And lo and behold, it's some of the same organisms that we find in the soil that grow around the crop root that are in our bodies, in our intestines, and also in the plants. Now, that's probably not too surprising since we eat things out of the garden. We're probably inoculating ourselves for generations, many generations, with what's in that ground. 
But it, isn't it amazing how these organisms are found and they give benefits in so many different places? It's being discovered that a lot of health problems, allergies, whatever, have to do with us eating food that's so refined that all these microbes that are living are refined out of it. Or growing in soil that's so sterile that they're not there in the first place. Uh, Noble Institute did something really interesting with fescue, with the endophyte in fescue. Unfortunately, it's not allowed for organic because they used a prohibited method, but they developed an endophyte for the fescue that gave all the benefits, and I, I need to back up a little bit. The endophyte doesn't just make the grass so the cows don't want to eat it. It's being fed by the plant, and it makes the fescue stronger. It makes it more resistant to disease. It makes it grow better. It makes it healthier. Drought, drought Right, it makes it more drought tolerant. It also is paying for the food by uh, protecting it from being eaten by animals. You know, that's part of the Part of the trade-off, isn't that a great deal? But the Noble Institute took this endophyte and kept all the benefits, but changed it by silencing the genes that were making the toxin so that you still had the good benefits, but the cows would eat it without, without any ill effect. Uh, we found that there is an endophyte in corn, and you all know what it's called because it's a dirty word, although this is a genus that has a lot of species in it. It's one species of Fusarium. It protects the corn by killing rootworm and corn borer, especially corn borer. But is it a surprise that we have Fusarium in corn when one of the beneficial endophytes in the right system, in the right microbial mix that's benefiting the corn is a Fusarium? But it's a little bit like kids. If you get in with a bad crowd, a good kid can go bad. Uh, the fusarium in the right population can be a benefit, but if it gets in with a, a different population of microbes, it turns outlaw. And it causes the mycotoxins that we see in our crops. Anyone here ever have trouble with mycotoxins in their corn? Or mycotoxins in something else? Uh, did you know that there are mycotoxins that are really good? You ever heard of penicillin? <laughs> Mycotoxins are toxins that fungi make. So it's, uh, this, this is a, to me, is a, a frontier. This is a really exciting new world. I, I wish I could have been born later to discover what we're going to learn <laughs> about biology. On the other hand, I probably should be satisfied with what I'm able to learn uh, or what I've learned so far. But if you looked at, um, if you looked at how all of nature is, we're starting to f see fuzzy lines between what's the plant and what's the soil. You know, what are the microbes? What's us and what's our, our microbial population? But there's, there's a whole frontier there. And this is why I think we could learn a lot. What we're seeing when these, these examples of by bringing one new species in, we're bringing in an, a new species of a higher plant but really what's the mode of action could be an insect, but it could just as likely be the microbes that live on the roots or live in the plant that are changing the biology of the whole system. I'm going to uh, go out on a limb a little here. I think I'm in, I'm in Bible Belt country, so I can say something. But uh, if we believe what we've read, when the world was created, it was declared good and it was very good, why are we treating the stuff around us like it's bad? You know, we look at these diseases, they only turn bad when they come out of balance in the system. You know, and this has to do with asking the right question. If we see an insect, uh, you know, when we do IPM, we don't want to see zero pest. We just want to count that we don't have damaging levels. When that pest or that disease, that fungus, whatever, is in balance, it, you know, is in a natural balance with the other organisms, it's there, but it's not causing trouble. When it comes out of balance, it suddenly explodes in number and starts doing damage. So I'm, I'm trying to give this to you as a lens 
for looking at when we have problems, even when we have diseases breaking out. You know, why would, why would one child be sick in a class and the rest not get sick? You know, even when there's a big outbreak or an epidemic, not everybody gets sick. You know, why is, how is this, uh, how is it different? It has to be the biology, the resistance, and the same is true for our crops. So as, as we start managing our pest problems, if we start asking different questions, we might end, might end up getting different answers. Uh, I really see it with weeds. And what I've, what I've noticed with weeds is the best adapted species seems to grow in a system when it's left alone. But not only does it grow, but the weed seeds that are dormant in the weed seed bank seem to be stimulated to come out of dormancy and to germinate when the conditions are right, but not when they're wrong. So, how did, so a few questions to think about. Why don't spring weeds come up in the fall? We've got some answers to that. Uh, some of our uh, biologists, plant physiologists, are telling us that you need a certain uh, wavelength of light or day length so that even though they're in the ground, the length of the day or the wavelength of the light acts as a trigger. What we've noticed, uh, and this, this was back to the Cornell Systems trial, uh, there's a form of phosphorus that when it's in high supply in the soil will make the whole amaranth family come out of dormancy. On our farm, uh, we, had a, we had a trial that I was doing with Chuck Moeller and we noticed that uh, we were looking for fertility response. I mentioned this yesterday too, <coughs> that when we put on enough poultry litter, uh, we were putting on different rates and we were looking for a re yield response curve. When we put on the rate that gave us our highest corn yield, um, we had a certain level of weeds. When we put on double that rate, the corn yield didn't go up at all, but the, the number of weeds of certain species that sprouted went way up and their growth rate went way up. So the weed biomass went up exponentially more. And when we put on three times as much as where we got our top yield of corn, it was still increasing the number of weed seeds and the rate of growth. We never found out where we'd get our top yield of weeds in those experiments. But what we did find out was that an awful lot of farmers are putting on far too much manure to benefit from it. And uh, just, just a little I'd, on farm management, I'm kind of a tightwad, and I tell farmers to do what's cheap first, do what's free first as far as getting, increasing your yields. We've got uh, all apologies to the people in the trade show selling products, but I, I would use the ones that are free first, and then the ones that are very cheap second, and reserve the really expensive ones until we've worn out doing everything that's cheaper. But in some cases, we actually could make more money by not buying us a problem. Sometimes some of the inputs we're buying are actually causing us trouble and costing us. So maybe the first thing we ought to do is stop buying inputs that are doing us damage <laughs> or that are not helping us. But this, uh, back to what we learned, was there was something about this one form of phosphorus that's in manure was causing the pigweed the Palmer amaranth, that whole family uh, to suddenly come out of dormancy. It also caused the uh, lamb's quarter and velvet leaf to come out of dormancy and sprout in much higher numbers. So somehow these weeds are responding to the environmental conditions that, make, uh, that favor them. Now, talk about a brilliant system. Why would those weeds waste their chance to grow until they have a good chance of growing? You know, there, there's some real brilliant engineering going on here that we're seeing the results of. How about uh, light? When you have a heavy, deep shading crop, this, this was, work was described by Dr. Al, Dr. Rademacher back in the 1920s and 30s in Germany. Have you ever noticed that after you plow sod down, you have a lot less weeds. 
or is that, uh, would that make sense to, uh, what Dr. Rademacher noticed was that when you've got very deep shade, and especially shade deep in the canopy, the weed seeds down below seem to go into a deep dormancy. No point in growing if, there are, if there's too much competition or if there's too much light. Uh, Dick and Sharon Thompson were pioneers at Pro Practical Farmers of Iowa. And I was at a talk that they gave once where they talked about, uh, it was a very late spring, it rained all the time, and he was on ridges. And they had a solid mat of foxtail growing on top of the ridges. And that when he peeled the foxtail off the top and planted, they never had any more weeds come for the rest of the spring. Apparently that foxtail, by being there, had sent some kind of a signal to the weeds under it. It said, don't bother trying to grow, I'm here. And because they were doing so little disturbance, that uh, they didn't get another, much of another flush. One of the triggers that brings weeds on is disturbance. We get a little flash of light, you know, we stir it, and these weeds that are, at diff that are ready to sprout are suddenly triggered to sprout. We need to remember that when we're doing tillage. We really need to remember it when we're cultivating or when we're doing blind cultivation. I'd, I'd uh, have a, I'm a terrible artist, so I'm not going to bore you with my uh, bad drawing, but if you think about when you plant a crop, let's say corn, say it's two inches deep, if you were to weed it the second day, the day after you planted, with a tine harrow, you're not going to do any damage to that corn. But you're also not going to do any damage to the weeds. They're not at a stage when you can hurt them. Even if they've been stimulated to grow, uh, the worst you're going to do is maybe dry the top out so that they just can't come. But you're, you're really not going to hurt any weeds that have started. Second day, you're probably not going to hurt any weeds either. If we weed too soon with a tine harrow, uh, it's a little like IPM. It'd be like going in and spraying the bugs too soon. We might get a few of them, the first ones that started, but we're going to miss the biggest flush that came, but we're going to start another flush because of our tillage. That disturbance is going to bring a second flush on. If we do that first treatment too early, we're actually going to create a second flush of weeds that's going to come at a time when our crop is susceptible so that we can't do our weeding the second time when it needs to be done. You know, these, these are observations that I've learned the hard way. Uh, one year I thought I was going to do a small plot and show that I could control all my weeds and I planted it and every day after I planted it I ran the weeder over the corn till it emerged. I had the most weeds I'd ever seen because I kept stimulating more to grow but I really wasn't getting them at the right stage. So these triggers um, that stimulate weeds to grow, to me, are a tool. And it's a place where, our, uh, especially here at Purdue, we've got people that are working in biotechnology. If we could use the tools of biotechnology to start understanding what are the biochemical reactions that are going on in these weed seeds that create a deep dormancy, and what are the reactions that cause them to break and to sprout? That could be a huge leg up on learning how do we manage our crop so that we reduce the weed pressure right from the onset by how we're manipulating the soil and how we're managing. Uh, my son actually noticed by accident one of these uh, relationships. We were planting, uh, we started planting uh, triticale and winter peas as a winter cover but because we've got a livestock component, we started harvesting at the end of May as a very high quality forage. When we turn that ground and plant black turtle soup beans, we found we had about a three week window of zero, almost zero weed emergence. There was something about that triticale and winter peas growing us, and this would be a good stand, that created a time when there was no weeds sprouting, even though we tilled the ground. And we found that when we do this regularly, we get a free ride. Those three weeks get our beans up to about this big. By the time we have to cultivate them, it's easy. 
Uh, we're also, we notice the same thing when we grow uh, winter barley. And this, this is a refinement on what I described that we, start, we use that winter barley because we had a problem with um, uh, Canada thistle, south thistle, several other perennials. Uh, we got greedy because not as much money in buck, not a lot of money in buckwheat. I mean, there's a lot of money in the benefits of it, but we're not, it's not a very valuable crop. But we found that there is a valuable crop that fits in that window in New York. We found that our pinto beans grow really well. Our, uh, our, in New York, the malting barley is ripe the last week in June. And we can get our pinto beans planted by the 1st of July. And we've learned that pinto beans don't yield as well if we plant earlier. They seem to hate blooming when it's hot at night. We have very hot nights if we plant our pinto beans during June. And we get very low yields. We found that if we harvest our barley and then plant the pinto beans, uh, we've, last year we averaged well over a ton to the acre. I think it was between 21 and 2200 pounds of pinto beans per acre at 70 cents a pound. And we had almost no weeds there. The barley was very heavy. I mean, it, this wouldn't happen on a poor stand of barley, but it was causing a very deep shade. The soil was really dark. And we harvested the barley, planted the pinot beans, and again, we had this long spell of almost no weed germination. It gave us a free ride in growing the pinot beans. Incidentally, I mentioned yesterday too, that one of the keys of sustainability, the first rule to me is if it's not profitable, it's not sustainable. You know, that's for any farmer. Uh, that crop of pinto beans that we grew last year, we took our barley off. It averaged about two tons per acre. Uh, we had two tons of straw per acre. The total value of the malting barley plus the straw came in at $900. But uh, 2,100 pounds of pinto beans cleaned and bagged, uh, 70 cents a pound added to that. And then the screenings was another 150 pounds per acre that went for cow feed. Uh, the total value of that crop makes corn look like it's not worth the trouble. And it was actually less work, and it spread our workload out because the barley was planted, barley was planted early the fall before, before we were planting other winter grains. It was combined the last of June when the combine wasn't needed for anything else. And our planting, season was extended by it. This is building a system where the pieces make everything go easier. The problem is we have to make these observations and we have to, we have to use, figure out how to use them. Uh, another observation we've made on our farm was that I don't believe we should be planting soybeans after corn. Now that sounds like shooting a sacred cow, but when we planted soybeans after corn, they always grew well. I'll, I'll give you that, and we, I still do it because we get a good yield of soybeans after corn. But what we found is that even when we cover crop those soybeans, we always have more erosion in the soybeans. It just, it's, it's just one of those things you can assume. There's something about soybeans following corn that that land seems to wash easy. And if I don't want, we've got four and five percent slopes and narrow strips, and if I don't want to see that soil leaving the farm, maybe I need to do something different. So what we've switched to is we're starting to plant uh, part of our barley. We're growing more and more barley, and part of it, instead of going into uh, the dry beans, we're also putting some of it into BMR sorghum sedan. BMR sorghum sedan loosens the soil. It grows on very little water. It ha it's allelopathic, so it further suppresses weeds. So there we get a weed-suppressing barley crop and a very strongly weed-suppressing uh, sorghum sedan crop. Incidentally, we're doing our tillage operations, so none of the weeds go to seed. When we take that off at the end of August for, for, uh, for feed, then we'll turn around a no-till, uh, a mixture of rye, uh, tillage radish, and we're actually seeing that the, a small amount of tillage radish with a rye increases the biomass of the rye. They, some, they play well together. 
Uh, we've been putting some Austrian winter peas in that mix. And I see a benefit there. You know, there were some questions about winter kill. But because we're cutting this early enough, we're getting some regrowth. We're leaving a stubble and we're getting regrowth of the BMR. And this would have to be timed out at this latitude with your weather probably to, to adjust for where you are. But I'm finding that the regrowth in the stubble is protecting our winter crop, the, the grain, the peas, and everything else that's in that mix from the bitter cold winds and storms that come from the north because it's cover. It keeps the wind off. It catches snow. It keeps the sun off in the middle of the summer or in the middle of the winter when the sun can make it kind of bright and then at night it gets really cold. It, it, it takes away some of those temperature swings so that we're getting a benefit from having this no-till residue left protecting the next crop. The next spring, and I, I do have, if you had time sometime and wanted to see it, I've got a video of us rolling down the rye to plant no-till soybeans. But the next spring, when it's time to plant soybeans, but before we're at full anthesis, we will plant our soybeans, no-till, into that rye. And then come back a, when it hits anthesis and crimp the rye down. Uh, we get zero erosion in our soybeans when we have that. In fact, we, we did, the last time we did it, we had some really violent, heavy rains, and the water coming out of those fields was clear. It was clean. And not very much was coming out of the fields because the soil was actually doing its job and soaking it in. It had that armor of the crimp rye on it. The raindrops weren't doing any damage when they hit because they were first hitting the rye. Most of it was soaking in, and we were storing it. You know, we need that water. We don't really want it to run off. We want to store it until the next time we have a dry spell. So then we uh, harvest those soybeans. We found that unlike when we're uh, fighting with the, the stones, we have a lot of stones in New York, and it's a lot of fun to run a flex head with stones, isn't it? <laughs> really it increases the maintenance on the combine. But when you're cutting the no-till soybeans, in the crimped rye, it's like putting grease under your head. You can pick up two or three miles an hour with a combine. You don't have to worry about hitting stones unless you, left, unless you didn't pick them when the rye was planted. But that having that cover literally lubricates under the head and makes you able to cut more efficiently, makes you able to cut closer. And it took, it took a lot of hours off the time it takes for harvest. Actually, it took days off our harvest time for the soybean crop because you could go faster. Now, we tried no-telling triticale and winter peas into that, and it wasn't real successful. I'm not quite sure what was going on there, though that, that, was, uh, that was going a bit far. The next thing we tried was going from that to kidney beans. And I'm still I'm questioning myself because I'm, I'm in new territory here. We're still experimenting, still observing. We had some of the nicest kidney beans we ever grew. But twice in a year, twice in a row now when we've done that, we've had Mexican bean beetle hit those kidney beans. And I'm wondering, did we set up a system that worked up to that point but wasn't ideal in terms of the bean beetle? That, this is a question we need to answer. And we need, to be, we need our Cornell researchers helping us understand is there was this a random thing or what is the connection between the bean beetle attack and what happened other than that those kidney beans were terrific so this, this is some of the small pieces that we're putting together if we have a group of farmers all trying different things and we share these pieces and someone else did something else that works we're all kind of we're all going to make advances faster and we're all going to be better off so i'd like to I'd like to encourage some questions if I'm missing things that people are interested in or give you a chance to redirect uh, where I'm going with this. Uh, are there any? Or? There's one question that came in, very specific. How many days after planting is the best time for first pass to time you? Okay, that's, that's actually a really good question because the answer is it depends. <laughs> Uh, okay, the question is, uh, what is the best time for the first pass with a tine weeder after planting? And it depends on temperature, on moisture. 
Uh, what I have found is I want to delay that first pass just as long as I can delay it without being at the point where I hurt the crop. Because, it, you know, we're getting, as we plant, the, the weed population gets more and more susceptible. But on a little different timing, the, the crop becomes more susceptible as it comes toward emergence. And every different tool, shape, shape and size of tines, uh, the type of spring at the top, every tine has a little different damage profile. And th this is actually a very good question because it goes into a broad topic. So we're, uh, we need to select which tine to use, and that will affect when we, make, when we do the most damage or when we start doing unacceptable damage to the crop. And that gives us another tool. So I will wait just as long as I dare and then do the first pass with a tine weeder because I want to delay that second flush of weeds just as long as I can delay it so that my crop is as big as possible before the second flush comes on. We've actually stopped doing the second pass with the tine weeder since we've gotten the camera guidance system and those finger weeders, those plastic stars, because we're finding we can get the crop big enough if by doing this delayed first tine weeding to eliminate the second tine weeding. Anytime we eliminate tillage and disturbance, we're actually reducing weed pressure in terms of the number of weeds that are sprouting. You know, that's a little counterintuitive because we think the more we weed, the better, but in, to some extent, we can get weed so often that we make the problem bigger. The point is that we have to make effective, we have to time it effectively, and then the weather plays, uh, can screw up our plans no matter how well they are laid out, because if it's going to rain on the best day for weeding, then we have to look at, do I move it up, or do I maybe back it off? Uh, I mentioned the tines, and th this is a whole other topic, which, uh, but I'll just, I'll get into that. Uh, at our website, it's www.lakevieworganicgrain, all one word, dot com. Uh, shameless promotion, but I don't think we'd sell anything to anyone out here. But there is a section of resources. And there's, if you maneuver through it, you can go through the links and click on resources. And there is a series of three articles we wrote for Rodale many years ago. Uh, the first one is on cultural weed control. This is the practices at that time it's kind of inadequate now and it's very obsolete, but those practices still work that reduce initial weed pressure. The second one is on tine weeding. And the third article is on cult in row cultivation. But in the tine weeding article, we show pictures of different types of and shapes of tines and the differences of how they work. And we can take advantage both on, by changing the type of tine and the setting and the operation of the tine to be more specific to the type of weed or to adjust for the conditions. So I'll, I'll give you two examples on the conditions. When it's extremely dry, it's very tempting to stop weeding. Oh, yes. So that's, that's some of the information that we put out. Don't stop cultivating and weeding when it's very dry because you don't see any weeds. Because there are three ways to kill a weed that I consider ethical. Poisoning to, is no longer on my list. Uh, the first one is desiccation, drying it out. When it's very dry, hot, and sunny, you don't have to totally uproot a weed seedling to kill it, especially if the wind is blowing. They don't last very long after they've been pulled loose. But when it's raining every other day, you, uh, they seem to come back to life you know, I've, I've pulled them all the way out and shook the dirt off on a bigger one and thrown it on top and the stinking thing is back to life the next time I come back because it was raining. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, suffocation is a different mode of action. Now suffocation doesn't work well when it's dry. As I mentioned, you can have these things most of the way buried and they'll push back out. If there's just a little bit of light and they push back out, you've got a mature root and a plant that just came out, and it looks like there's nothing there and we're good, and two weeks later, where did all that come from? So that's why we don't want to stop cultivating when it's dry, but we need to bury deeper. But when it's wet, uh, it's very easy to kill a weed by suffocation. 
And that's a uh, comment on the last talk about uh, you might have, maybe should have cultivated more when it was wetter. We're finding that when it's really wet, if we can get those weeds just stirred up and buried, the next rain comes, the soil kind of melts over it and they're sealed in and they're gone. In fact, if we do a good job with a tine weeder and then get a rain and the ground crusts slightly, you can end up with a total kill of all the weeds if they've been buried. Because if you bury them and then get a rain, they seal in, they're gone. Uh, I learned about that the hard way because I did that. I was getting a little cocky when I first saw, noticed this, and I was burying the crop along with the weeds. And the corn would push back out until one time I had a cloudburst. And the corn wasn't pushing back out. And I went out with a rotary hole and I got some of it freed up. But I, I, I did a real job on the weeds, but I sure did a real job on the corn. So I'm, I'm a little less aggressive about burying the corn with my weeder now than I used to be. It's one of those do as I say, not as I did uh, situations. Uh, one other example. So, so when it's wet, we, just, we need to go for suffocation. When it's dry, we need to go for desiccation. Uh, the other way to kill a weed is to sever it so that none of the pieces can survive. Now our old weeding tools that we had here, and I uh, used the example yesterday of that 153 that's modified, those shovels go deep. They do a very good job of uprooting, they do a very good job of burying. The Europeans have developed a different approach. They have, they've set their teeth to run very shallow, and they're more like a surgeon's knife. If you can set them to run three quarters of an inch underground, they do very little disturbance. And it looks like you miss the weeds until you pull on them and they're dead, but they don't know it yet because they've been cut just below the ground. So that, that approach has advantages. Uh, if, if you bury it real deep, obviously you've got to come back a second time and bury it again because you're going to have that other flush coming. But with these European shovels, you can get away with maybe not stimulating as many because you're leaving, you're cutting underground and not disturbing as much and not getting that second flush to come. Uh, with the tine weeder, there's different shapes, and Lely has a unique shape. That's almost a 90 degree angle. I think they call it 100 or 110. And we run it in soybeans on tap rooted crops. You can run that tooth on top of a soybean and have it going in the ground two inches, and it will not kill that soybean because the soybean is a tap root, and you can go down and disturb it. As long as you're not going so fast that you broke the soybean, it's not going to hurt it. But any weed that has a branching root is coming out. And it's pretty amazing to watch a Lely tooth run through soybeans if it's adjusted correctly because it will pull the weeds out and leave the soybeans unhurt. So you can be really aggressive and that, that gives you a lot of flexibility. Now try that with corn. Corn has a branching root. If you do good with a lely on corn, it means the ground is crusted so hard the teeth aren't getting in the ground. Because if the teeth are getting in, they're catching the branches on the corn roots and they're pulling those corn roots out. So that, there's a lot of common sense in, involved in using these weeders, but there's an in-depth discussion of that on the, uh, on the website. Uh, any? Okay, so a couple questions came in related to... Um, growing practices for organic corn. I know that um, you've sort of stimulated our thinking and we've had a lot of discussion over the last two days about getting outside of the corn and soybean paradigm, but yep. corn's still an important crop. Oh yeah. Um, so I don't know if you could share some of your tips and, and practices sure. for raising good organic corn on your- So corn. out of 1,700 acres, we do grow 300 to 350 of corn every year. It's, and it is profitable. I'm, I would contend it's a lot more profitable because we're growing less acres. Uh, New York doesn't have the corn soils you have out here, but I have seen the yield monitor go above 300 bushels in New York. And it won't do it if you're growing corn every second year or every third year. Uh, one thing that we learned with corn, we do lose yield if we plant later, but that might be negated if we, ha or if we plant earlier, I mean. We, we, lo we lose yield planting later, we do better planting earlier. But the gain of planting earlier can be negated if you can't control the weeds. You know, planting earlier, the corn grows slower. The weeds probably don't grow any slower. You have a little different kind of weeds, but it creates a challenge. 
to do those or to do the early planning. The other challenge we've run into with early planning of corn, and I'm talking about the first half of May where we are, not second half of April like we used to do it, is that the fertility, our modern corn hybrids have been selected to need type 1 nitrogen. It means that the, in the breeding plots where these hybrids are developed and being selected, uh, they've, they've got excellent fertility. And they're the ones that are doing best that are being selected as new hybrids and the inbreds they're using are the ones that want their nitrogen up front. In fact, what I've seen with them is they can't have a da bad day. If, if a corn, corn seedling has a bad day, you're losing yield. If you go back to the genetics we had in the 70s, uh, still remember Herman Warsaw had 300... 38 bushels per acre, which at that time seemed impossible. But that genetics was more type 2 nitrogen, that it could wait for its nitrogen a little longer. It didn't have to have it up front. We've seen that shift, and because organic nitrogen is avail comes available slower, and it comes available as it mineralizes, uh, we're at a bit of a disadvantage with this new genetics, and we have to compensate. So one thing we're doing and I, met, I alluded to it earlier, is we're putting, when we plant early, if the ground is not warm, we're putting some up to 50 pounds of Chilean nitrate in the starter band. Now that hurts us on the export market, although our corn's not being exported, so it doesn't hurt us on corn, but we have to think about what follows the corn if we want to export anything to Europe or to Canada. Uh, we're also putting 10 pounds of elemental sulfur in the band. I mentioned that because of the phosphorus. Uh, we use uh, a fur trail starter that gives us a good trace element package. We want to be very sure to have enough boron in the starter band, but you see what I'm trying to do is create a, uh, a band, a zone around that seedling that gives it the best possible conditions to get started. And I believe what this Chilean nitrate is doing is not so much feeding the corn as it's feeding the biology. When it's cold and wet, uh, the microbes that mineralize our nitrogen into the NO3 form, make it available to the plant in that nitrate form, work very slowly. And when the soil is waterlogged and there's no oxygen, we have a different set of microbes that use the oxygen on the NO3 as their oxygen supply, and they denitrify. So we're actually breaking NO3 down putting it back in the atmosphere when the ground is waterlogged. So when it's cold and wet, we're both mineralizing the nitrogen slower, we're mineralizing our phosphorus slower, we're doing everything slower, but yet the corn is bred so that it wants the minerals available right now. And that's the reason we're, we're taking this band and giving it a little extra shot of very soluble nitrogen, uh, making sure there's enough sulfur there just trying to do anything we can to speed up the biology that mineralizes the fertility that's in, that, in the soil. And uh, obviously, we're, with the weed control, we're paying a lot of attention to detail. And our, I mentioned our son, uh, Peter, is not at all averse to technology. He loves technology. Uh, there is a machine, it's a guidance system, uses a camera. And we've been able to do a lot better job of weeding when the corn is small with this camera. Uh, when we first got it, it drove us crazy. He was able to run it. I couldn't. I didn't have the patience. I had to go back to my old cultivator. I used to tell him, you just let me watch. Let me show you how to do it with this old machine. I know how this works. And then he pointed out, he said, yeah, but you've covered one acre and I've covered four using the cameras. What he's done since then is he's upgraded the software. He's added a second camera so that we're running two cameras looking at the row. What they're doing is looking for contrast. You can calculate from the height how far apart rows are. So it's looking for contrasting rows that are 30 inches apart, figuring out the, uh, the trigonometry. And we've got one on each side. What used to make the machine go blind is if you had it, if you were turned around going north and south and the, wind, and the sun was setting in the west, you'd be in the shade. Not only that, but the cleats of the tractor were creating a strobe. And that was blinding the camera. But the one on the other side was doing fine. 
So we would get into a spot where it worked in one direction, wouldn't work in the other. But by having two cameras and upgrading the software, we're now able to put that cultivator in the ground. And even if we're doing a, like a small vegetable like beets where you can't see the row, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be, that camera can see them. And we're finding that in the middle of the night, uh, you can get an infrared version or we can put lights on it and the camera will still stay dead on the row better than any human can pilot it. And by doing that and using the finger weeders, uh, we're able to plant the corn a little bit earlier and still do a good job on uh, weed control. So what, what I have found is we have no trouble producing enough nitrogen to produce 300 bushel corn with our cover crops. A medium red clover cover crop can easily make 300 pounds of available N. Uh, we've, we've shown it over and over. The trick is to get that N to mineralize at the right time for the crop. If it mineralizes too late, all it's going to do is make weeds. It's sort of like the, the fireman coming after the house burned down. The crop needs it when the crop needs it. You know, and having it come later doesn't do a bit of good. Or if we, if we do tillage too early with a legume, we're we could be mineralizing too early and having it leach away. So fall plowing is a disaster because all that nitrogen is mineralizing in the fall and over winter and being lost before the crop ever gets it. Not only is it a disaster from that standpoint, but it's sending an organic farmer could legitimately be accused of polluting the water downstream if that nitrogen is being leached away. Another reason to keep the ground covered. So using those techniques and uh, picking good corn varieties, ones that are adapted to our, our location. Uh, we have, we've had a farm average across the scales of 182 dry shelled, and we're, we're in a rain shadow. We seldom have good rainfall midsummer, and we certainly don't have the soils you have out here. I have seen, we've had, a, we've had test plots that averaged over 200 bushels in individual, lots of individual fields, over 200 bushels. But I, if we were planting corn more intensively, we wouldn't, the soil health would not support that. We wouldn't have that kind of yields, especially on our soils, because they're relatively weak soils. And I think here you could probably get away with a little more intensive corn just because the ground is better, but why do it if you can make just as much money on some of the other crops? Okay, so once again, I think we could keep going with, with questions all day, but we've got warm food, warm lunch out there that we should turn to. Uh, let's show Klaus our appreciation.